Good morning, everyone. As Stephen says, my name's Glenn, and I must say that I'm extremely pleased and honoured to be asked to present at Conway Hall in front of such a friendly bunch of people. Um, last time I was at Conway Hall, I was a guest for the British Humanist Association's Atheist, Humanist and Secularist Student Societies Conference. And talking about this stage today, of the four people that you'll see stood up here, I would be the one who isn't quite yet professor or doctor, and I don't have any books to plug, so your wallets are quite safe. However, I was actually given a flyer by Newham Bookshop, so they might not be safe for that long, if I ever get round to writing one, that is. My talk today um, will be, as Stephen said, around the concept of morality. I would just like you to start by considering the following passage. But this quote is quite poignant, that gives me quite a nice segue to talk about religion and morality, and because I will be covering the aspects of being an intentional or an incidental killer later on in my talk. So the flow of the talk generally then, I'm going to start backwards as it seems to me, at the level of the personal anecdote, how our experiences shape who we are, and also how society helps shape the opinions that we form through our personal experience. Then I'm also going to something a bit more technical, to talk about neurobiology and some of the underpinning mechanisms that we think might contribute, contribute to moral decision making. So my argument, in essence, is that the individual with a sufficiently evolved and healthy brain and as part of wider society produces the social norms and the moral codes that we choose to live by. And that word choice will become apparent later on in the talk. So to begin with, at the level of probably the least scientific instrument you could think of, a personal anecdote, your personal anecdote might be similar to this and it could follow the following format. So for, for me, for example, there we go. My father was particularly important to me, is, he's not dead yet. He was a Catholic, uh, he went to a Catholic school, and he was quite a devout Catholic up until the day he asked one of the nuns at Catholic school whether God, uh, sorry, Jesus might be a magician. For this he received a swift slap around the face, and you know, henceforth he wasn't a Catholic anymore. I was baptised, um, but that was because it was my father's family's religion, which is often the case. Frankly, I'm quite surprised my head didn't burst into flames when it touched the font. But hey ho. My father introduced me to concepts such as science, astronomy in particular, but also to appreciate the weight of evidence and to appreciate other people's beliefs as well as my own. But without religion in my life, for example, there was a bit of a vacuum for other things. And as it stood, in my life, Queen and Star Trek became the religions in my household. And I challenge anyone in the audience to tell me that if they've been to a Queen concert or a Star Trek convention, it isn't every bit as fundamentalist as any of the religious fundamentalist groups out there. <laughs> so following on from this then, I was also influenced quite heavily by literature, whether it was fantasy, fiction, factual, music as well, and art. I was actually at an art exhibition at my university um, later on, art for me is something that looks like something else, you know, a skillful painting, not a splodge or a scribble, but perhaps my nuance with regards to art is a bit out there. After this, I think my six years in the British Army, I spent time in Afghanistan and as a communications liaison in Pakistan in the British High Commission, also helped sculpt my opinions and my experiences of the world around me. But the social norms and the moral codes that I think that I hold have been elucidated to me through an apparent interaction with social groups as well as wider society. And also I would like to think through my own critical and compassionate reflections as an adult. So this individual anecdote, exactly, you might be thinking, well, you know, that's not science, is it? That's you just wittering on, so to speak, about your life. However, Every single one of us might follow, have a particular story just like this, and it has helped to inform and influence you and who you've become today. In the context of our social group then, those people that surround us, whether it's family, whether it's a religious group, or indeed a Star Trek or Queen concert. Balmar and Boyer in 2013, they wrote a paper that highlighted a few similarities that a lot of religious groups have. And it could contain some of the following ritual, well, lots of religious groups have prayers, baptism, we have things like circumcision and pilgrimage, but then again, the Queen fans got concerts, karaoke, they also have the living room con congregation, you could call it, in front of the TV to watch Star Trek. And who, who doesn't know Space the Final Frontier? Who can complete that? Go on then. No, <laughs> you're not going to. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise, and so on. There's also fellowship. Any social group revolves around a principle of mutual interest. A lot of these social groups, being as they are offshoots of the original 
social interest, which was survival and the need to live in a coalitional group in order to prosper as a species. We also have aspects of worship. Everyone knows that worship of supernatural deities is key to many monotheistic religions, at least. But again, concerts and um, soaps and things like that, they also give us the essence of a mutual interest. One interesting fact about such um, experiences of worship could be the fact that there's an inducement of, the trans of a trance-like state. In psychology, there are many mechanisms that underpin this phenomenon. Think about a well-charismatically-led um, congregation or a faith healing event. These, to me, have more akin to a rock concert, a performance of some sort than any sort of miracle. You have a rhetoric which ebbs and flows, you have music which gets louder and softer, you have a charismatic person on stage, and people do come out of the other end of these experiences with an emotional experience, something that transcends themselves, which of course it does because everyone else is present in the room at the time, but also they do think that there's something above and beyond this social aspect to it. I would say the last claim is, not dodgy, but it's a lot less easy to pin down. A lot of religions and other groups have their own texts. For example, you have the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah, just for the three main monotheistic religions. But then the Queen Fan have lyrics, for example, which I think will transcend time, and, and quite well to have done. We've also got the Prime Directive in Star Trek. I know that's quite a tenuous link, but that's the only one I could think of for that one. Um, and every social group, including Queen fans and Star Trek fans, they all have beliefs. So you might believe that your particular religion is the one true word of God, for example. You might think Freddie Mercury is the best singer of all time. Or you might think that space exploration, as highlighted by Gene Roddenberry, is a noble pursuit. But something that these groups also share, which isn't usually brought up by those that expound the messages of religious groups, is schism. There are always differences of opinion within religious groups, but again, in every other social group as well. So you could be a Christian. You might be a Protestant, you might be a Catholic. You might believe that the resurrection actually happened. You might think it was a metaphor. You might believe in the virgin birth, but in the words of Thomas Aquinas, which is more likely that the natural order is suspended or that the Jewish mink should tell a lie. We're to, we are to believe that the Virgin Mary had a virgin birth like a lizard. Godzilla did that. Lizards can do that. Remember when Godzilla laid all those eggs in Madison Square Garden? They were all born pre-fertilized and they were then able to have children immediately. Lizards do this. Humans don't. There is absolutely no evidence for it. You could be a Muslim. There are many different factions within Islam. You've got Sunnis and Shias, this sectarian divide causing many, many conflicts around the world. I think this um, originated with regards to an, an argument as to who was supposed to succeed the Caliph Abu Bakr or Ali. You could also be a Sufi, you could be an Ahmadi, you could even say that the Baha'is traced their faith and lineage back to Islam, or they wouldn't call themselves Muslim. Or you could be a Jew, you could be Orthodox Jewish, or you could be a comedian that just picks fault at your own religion but can still appreciate all of the good bits of it. Queen fans aren't a monolithic bunch either. You might think, as I said before, that Freddie Mercury is the best singer of all time, but then you might think that Paul Taylor is actually just as good. You might think that Paul Taylor, Paul Rogers, can't, can't ever remember this guy's name, is the voice of Freddie Mercury, born again to grace our ears with his singing voice. But you might also think that Freddie Mercury, there is no God but Freddie Mercury and Paul Rogers is his messenger. That happens to be my opinion. But again, there's no cohesion between Star Trek fans either. You could prefer the rogue in Captain Kirk. You could prefer the older, wiser, much bolder image of Captain Picard. You might think there are the entirely too men on television and so Captain Janeway addresses this gender bias for you. You might think that there are entirely too many white folks on TV nowadays and so Commander Sisko is definitely for you. Oh, that's technically Deep Space Nine, not Star Trek, but I think you can see where I'm going. Now, you can probably appreciate these are quite superficial comparisons, but what they do show is that actually humans will form groups around absolutely anything. We all have mutual interests and these seem to be enough for us to gravitate together as a coalitional species. And as I've said before, these are merely offshoots of the original pursuit, which was survival and to prosper as a species. Something else that Baumard and Boyer observed was that actually, in many of the monotheistic religions, they all have a version, despite their own internal schisms, of the golden rule. This seems to be one of the underpinning uh, points of morality within these monotheistic religions. 
A lot of people think that actually this is the main point of religion. And whilst we take in this, there seems to be a piece of scripture for every religion, whether it's Jainism, whether it's Islam, whether it's Christianity, that justifies the golden rule in some way. But just while you read a few of those quotes, think to yourself, is this really a justifiable position? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So repeat it a few times in your head. Just think about that for a second. What's the moral precedent there? Well, you're making your, your own experience the moral standard by which you judge others, aren't you? Is it really that good? When we think about it in these terms, is it really very good to say maybe you might think that executing apostates is a virtuous and justifiable act? And just because you like a bit of roughness in the bedroom doesn't mean I do. This individualist view of you know, judging other people um, and your acts with regards to them as well, based on just your experience, seems to be a bit limiting in my eyes. But if we don't have the golden rule as a start-off principle, what else do we have? We have to start by asking ourselves exactly what is morality? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary defines morality as a noun, it's a distinction between right and wrong. So what does this tell us? Frankly, it tells us that you know, we can read a dictionary, so you know, well done us there. But I think that we can all agree that moral judgments aren't just to do with the distinction between right and wrong. They're actually to do with when we trespass against each other. And I think, moreover, not just each other, but also the life forms. We can't get away from this now, that animals are a lot more developed than we thought they were to begin with, and we try to think of them as sentient beings as well. So maybe a better definition of well, not definition, but a better sort of moral we can take from this is that we should attempt to improve the general well-being for all sentient life forms. Now, what we mean by this are these creatures that we can reasonably assume have the propensity to experience, to feel, perhaps even suffer, and have self-awareness. And we know we're gathering more and more information, maybe through neuroscience and the study of biology, that this might actually be the case. So if we agree that this is a good place to start, can we agree that it's at least halfway there, if not all the way there, yeah, a couple of nods. Then moving on from this, we really have to start thinking about how we're going to design our moral cognitions around a model if we are actually going to say that improving the sort of well-being of all sentient life forms is an important moral virtue to follow. It gives us two main options. So we could talk about objective morality, for example. Objective morality tends to be rather absolutist, as it is being from God, you're not supposed to change it. However, you can think of perhaps thou shalt not kill, a very absolute statement, but I think many of us in the audience would probably agree that thou shalt not kill actually turns into thou shalt perhaps murder the outgroup or the apostate and all the heretic within. So if that doesn't sound like, even though it's an absolutist judgment, it sounds like a good thing not to, not to kill. It sounds very intuitive. We don't have to belabor the, the thought process there. Very easy to get on board with a statement like that. And your intuitions will become apparent later on. But if it's objective mal uh, morality, it means it's not influenced by your personal opinion. Um, and uh, indeed, in the, word of, the words of a colleague of mine up at the University, of, at the University of Central Lancashire, he actually used to work for BAE Systems, he once said to me that physics is objective. So physics is an objective property of the universe. Aircraft fly because they obey the laws of physics. If you deviate from them, then the aircraft won't fly. It's a trade-off between ability, uh, agility sorry, and stability. And one of the other things that he said was we'd quite happily sell the Saudis a squadron of typhoons, but they'd have to pay a little bit extra for that bit of computer trickery that makes them fly. And this is, of course, true. But moral cognitions don't seem to be like this. They seem to be altogether a more reflective process that we have to go through. So the objections to the statement that I've just made then is that before, for example, Moses was delivered the Ten Commandments on the top of Mount Sinai, that actually we're all running around raping, pillaging, you know, nicking each other's wives, that kind, of that kind of thing. However, it seems to me to be abundantly more clear that that wasn't what we were doing. Actually, most of the religions in, throughout the, the scope of evolutionary time anyway, didn't concern moral prescriptions. Most of them were actually more concerned with the correct practice of ritual, for example. The examples could include the, the Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Aztecs. They weren't really moralizing religions in the traditional term that Baumer and Boyard have said. And then you get told that actually there can't be morality without God. And you may have come across some of these objections before. So if there isn't God, 
Why don't you rip and kill all you want to? Nobody says this better than Penn Gillette. He says, I have ripped and killed everyone I want to. It's just that my list of people that I want to rip and kill is zero. Why isn't yours? Now you need to think about that. Why isn't it just zero? It seems to be zero, doesn't it? We, we have an inbuilt notion that murder, that infanticide rightly repulse us, although they didn't always, and scripture has been used in the past to justify such practices. You might come across a second, well, you can't disprove God or hell, so why take the chance? My stock response to this would be, I can't disprove God and hell, but I can't disprove Dumbledore or Hogwarts either, and which one do you think I'm more about going to? Always wanted to be a wizard. But the take home message from that is basically that you are making your moral choices based on the promise of either a reward or a punishment in the afterlife, which to me seems to be a pernicious doctrine, as does the notion that through charitable giving or self-flagellation that you can somehow diminish your amount of responsibility or the punishment that you might actually undergo in the hereafter. And finally, the last thing would be, well, what objective standard do you base your morality on? It seems to be a very, a very, very hard challenge that people give you. I think my answer to that would actually just be that well, I don't. I think the humanists in the room wouldn't either. What we do is we sit and we weigh the balance of the evidence and we discuss any of the problems that we come across in the context of the situation that we find them and we temper our rational, we'd like to think, rational positions with empathy and compassion to reach a decision. And we choose overall. But then so did you. So did the believer. The believer also chose to endorse their text. Now, this is actually quite important. Because if you had the ability to choose what was a morally virtuous book to follow, then this means that you might have an underlying process that allowed you to do so. You talk to um, people like Noam Chomsky, for example, on language development. He would say that every infant has a language acquisition device. So that child can pick up very, very simple phonology, and then they can apply semantic and syntactic um, content to that. I would argue that actually, Children also have a morality acquisition device. Even very, very young infants are able to, they're able to recognize charity, they're able to see fairness as well, they're able to divide up rewards sometimes, which is something lower order animals don't do. Apes have been seen to sort of do this when they share food, but you could actually say that that's just in sync rather than actually reflecting upon the more moral nuances of fairness in the, in the situation. But if we don't hold true to the objective standards of morality, we need to think, well, what else is there? So we could actually subscribe to more a subjective one. Subjectivity then. Think about throughout history, there have been many, many different thoughts that different thinkers have had. The first philosophy book I ever read, I think, was the Hamelin History of Philosophy. It was published in about 1997. And that takes you through pre-Socratics to religion and the Renaissance. It talks about the contributions of Marx and Hume and Kant and Mill and people like that, all those various luminaries. And you see exactly what I'm talking about. People struggling throughout human history to actually pen what constitutes right and wrong, rather than just follow a dogmatic principle written down in the first or seventh century. And we do struggle with this. We really do, and we still don't get it right. I think the Convention of Human Rights was a good go at it. I think that religious groups are probably the first coherent way of codifying moral behaviours. But I think that actually a subjective approach is probably the one that I would go for and I think makes sense with regards to human psychology and neuropsychology. Um, if we think about, for example, a classic model of dual processing with regards to um, human intuition and deliberation, we have one system. System one deals with quick, automatic, implicit and intuitive um, thought processes. So this is may be more applicable to religious texts. So for example, remember I said it was very intuitive to get on board with thou shalt not kill. We don't really have to think about it at all, do we? But then people who endorse a more slow, deliberate and reflective sort of thought process, then obviously you've got both of these, but I think the human mind has room for both. I would say that humanists probably inhabit this section here, but actually all of us do as well. Every single one of us does because we temper our, what we think are rational cognitions with our emotive and intuitive underlying process as well. And this is how we end up at a decision of, of, by deliberating, as I said, with each other. And we just use these um, different thought processes to, as I've mentioned already, 
arrive at our, the correct decision that we think it, with, regard, with regards to whatever context we find ourselves in. So if we endorse a more humanistic thought process, so something along the lines of maybe a consequentialist um, thought process, what kind of questions does this open up to us? Well, if we just had thou shalt not kill, for example, we wouldn't be able to talk about things like assisted dying. Now, no one says this better than Terry Pratchett when he said that those people thus far have taken that trip to Dignitas to die in Switzerland, seem to be very clear and firm of purpose and have a clear prima facie case for wanting to end their own lives on their own, from their own free will. Add to this that I actually at the time a British Social Attitudes survey found that 92% of non-religious and 71% of religious people actually endorse assisted dying in specific circumstances and that last year in the UK at least 48% of people identified as non-religious. This really does become a debate and not just a principle of thou shalt not kill. Other questions that we might be able to answer if we apply this more consequential model of thinking Military intervention in different countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. Is it right to just leave a dictator to continue abusing his population with impunity? Or should we have got involved? Nobody likes to frame a question as should we get involved in a war. You never get a positive response when you say that. But again, it's a discussion that we can have using this model of thinking. And we also have aspects of population control that we can talk about as well. Is it right to just keep bringing new life into this world in a world with finite resources, hardly any cultivatable land to grow crops on or rear livestock. You try telling parents that they can't have the tenth children, you know, and you're not going to get a very good response. But again, this is a question that we can ask ourselves if we actually use the rational, the reflective, tempered by the empathetic and the compassionate. Now, these are just very life and death problems. All of them are about uh, mortality. But then there are other questions, such as the recent success with regards to equal marriage. And so that was um, a principle of, of moral virtue that we thought very strongly about, strongly enough to put it through the House of Commons, the Lords and the Royal Assent and actually get it accepted. The reason that these are all um, quite life and death questions have become apparent with regards to the, the uh, research later on. But if we are an individual and if we are influenced by our social experiences um, and we we endorse a model of both intuitive and em empathic reasoning as well as the more deliberative and rational one. What is it that allows us to do this? Well, human neurology tells us quite a lot about this nowadays. We know, for example, that like physics, the brain seems to us to be an objective thing. Being as it is just proteins programmed for by your genes in DNA, which themselves are constrained to be molecules on the periodic table. We know that it objectively exists. I know that's quite a strong statement. People often say to me, well, we don't experience our own brain, so how can it possibly exist? Well, we've got a wealth of evidence that backs up this assertion. We can prod and probe and look at other people's brains. Actually, you could look at your own if you went under uh, local anesthetic for brain surgery. Sometimes tumors are removed in surgery by the surgeon keeping the patient awake. If it's a tumor near a language center, we call it um, Broca's area. The patient will have to be awake so that they can respond to the surgeon's request just to make sure he's not damaging, needlessly damaging other neural tissues. So we could see our own brain, in effect. And we know that without the brain, that we can't access the world around us or what it means for us to be human, really. We can't access the, the, the thoughts and feelings that we associate with our experiences. I know these are quite strong statements saying that we know, but actually we know beyond reasonable doubt that this is the case that this organ gives rise to, hopefully, what it, what it is for us to be human. What we also know about the, the brain in terms of neurology, and not just the human brain, as I said at the start, we know that other animals with large brains, for example, they also have some of the same attributes, no, nowhere near our level of cognition, but they do have, we can't get away from this now. Some are able to empathize, we think, or they, they at least exhibit behaviors that are con uh, about concurrent with empathy. Elephants, for example, have been known to mourn the long dead bodies of the calves, even historically so, passing a site where that body is no longer. Younger elephants in a group, if the bulls are removed from that group, will be develop behavioral defects because they haven't had the mentoring that other elephants with the bulls in the herd have had. Dolphins, for example, put them in front of a mirror. They seem to know it's them. They seem to have a sense of self. They also seem to engage in behaviors that to our eyes, just like recreational play, as well as cooperative hunting, 
science we think of intelligence. And also, last but not least, the great apes. I had occasion last week to speak to Dr. George McGavin. He's um, an Oxford research associate and a BBC presenter. Um, and he's actually met a, an ape that could light a fire, cook marshmallows, and the ones out there that can do sign language, respond to verbal human speech without any facial cues at all, which is quite impressive as well. We all know that they're able to learn and teach and pass their skills down through generations, and also that they too develop rules by which to regulate their primate societies, just as we do. And I saw a documentary on television last night about bats, and I remember that actually I'd read, read a book by Matt Ridley called The Origins of Virtue, where he talks about not the moral decision-making of bats, but at least reciprocity and proportionality. So a bat, for example, that returns home and it's not had a feed, bats can't survive very long if they miss missed too many days of not eating. If it approaches another member of its colliery, straight away it can actually discriminate between one member and another, but it might receive a charitable blood donation from that member of that colony. If another member of the colony that's never given a charitable donation approaches that bat, then it won't get one. The bats seem to understand this principle of reciprocity because, again, when the bat that has given a charitable donation, or at least has a reputation for doing so, I'm not sure that bats actually keep score reputation-wise, who's nicer than everyone else, but it will regurgitate some blood to the one that's been charitable in the past. Now, I'm in no way saying that bats are sophisticated moral philosophers, but what I am suggesting is that these might at least be some of the behavioural underpinnings of our at least reciprocal behaviours that allow us to form complex coalitions within the species. But when we turn back to humans then, we've got our individual experiences shaped by our social, our social groups. We've also got this convergence of evidence that suggests that actually it's big brains, but big healthy brains that give us the ability to do the things that we do, and that animals share this with us. In terms of human moral um, decisions then, the recent research, it's easy to couch in general terms of uh, utilitarianism and non-utilitarianism. So the, the idea that you should always go for the act that promotes the best amount of good for the most amount of people versus non-utilitarianism. An the important point to note here is that actually the research that we do, we're not trying to generate a normative theory of ethics that everybody should follow. We're just interested in what decisions people make and possibly why and how. As we mentioned before, there are many contributors to this field. Um, I can see Stephen looking at me from the back corner there. Probably knows a lot more about this than I do. But it is, in psychology, we need to find something that's quite measurable. And there exists a very distinct and measurable difference between the utilitarian decisions people make and the non-utilitarian decisions they make. And this is why I'm quite happy to continue with this as the focus for this research. So some of the problems that we use, I'm sure people are, will be quite familiar with some of them. Um, as a stimuli, we can use something called the trolley problem. So the trolley problem, simply put, is that there's a trolley coming down a track. It's going to kill five people. You can flip a switch, save those five people, and, kill, and just kill one person. There's another version of this then, where instead of flipping a switch, it's exactly the same scenario, but you push someone off a bridge. Now remember that quote at the start where it was all about the intent to kill, yeah? We find very different results, even though this is in essence the same problem, just with one twist. Actually, having said that, you've got the Simpsons, which are yellow, the Family Guy, which are pink. So you could have a racial bias there. You could have the like me effect. Are you less likely, like, if you ask students, are you likely to kill you know, one homeless people, five students, that kind of thing, you get this like me effect. But in order to do some rather strong and measurable research, we try to keep problems like this as sterile as possible. So it's enough to say that just actually, there are people on the track rather than cloud the issue with a lot of other variables. We also have other problems, such as the violinist, which detracts slightly from the statistical manipulations there on the screen. So the violinist is something along the lines of, there is a famous violinist, he's very ill, he has a very rare blood type. Um, his, his followers have kidnapped you because they found out that you've got this rare blood type, have chloroformed you and they've taken you to the hospital, and you wake up and you're actually connected up to his circulatory system, and the doctor informs you that, well, you know, I wouldn't have done this if I'd have known you'd been kidnapped. Well, you were unconscious when they brought you in, so I don't know how we missed that. But you can stay here for nine months and then walk away, and you'll both be completely fine. It's a good deal. However, you can choose to just get up and leave, in which case he'll die, but you'll definitely be fine. 
Now, this is meant to be analogous to pregnancy with the time constraint and the fact that one person's life is dependent on yours. I would say it's probably more like rape because you were, for you were forced into something else. But this is just to show that there are a variety of thought problems out there. It's just that the trolley problem seems to be one of the more simple ones that we can use to elicit this utilitarian and non-utilitarian dichotomy. So this is a sample of the results that my team conducted last year. And we find that just using that sterile trolley problem that we were talking about, that if you keep the amount of people to be saved exactly the same, so five there, but you increase the amount of people that are going to be sacrificed, there's quite a nice linear trend that drops off there. People are less likely to endorse it when you're sacrificing more people to save a greater number of people still. Although you're still saving more people, aren't you? So really your net outcome is a lot better. This is only a small sample of our results, but we also found that if it's just a difference between one person or it's double, people are around the 40 to 60% mark. It's a lot less easy to endorse a sacrifice of a person just by flipping a switch if the numbers are quite close together or only halfway there. One of the things that we also find with this research then that isn't depicted is that if we ask the question, would you push, that five versus one is flipped on its head. Virtually nobody will do. I think it's about 20% usually. And you might think that this is just one study, but these results are replete throughout the literature. So again, it's a very measurable outcome that we're looking for. We also have to make sure that people understand the difference between a non-fatal problem, which is all to do with life and death, and just a moral problem. So you could ask them something to make sure, like a recruitment problem. So the idea that you are a recruitment manager, you have two candidates in front of you. One's very well qualified, the other one not so much. But your boss phones you and says, well, the underqualified candidate is actually a family friend. Give them the job otherwise. You still get this um, effect with the, the push scenario and the trolley problem. People are very, very unlikely to do this. So it shows you that a person's moral compass is open to other things other than life and death decisions. And this is how we distinguish between people who can actually understand the moral sort of salience of a situation and those non-moral problems. But when we have this behavioural result then, we know what it is people say. We know what it is they, they say, what, what answers they'll give, and why they endorse the behaviours that they do if they self-report on a questionnaire. But what is it that's making them do this? Is there anything that's making them do this, for example? Well, we can use neuroimaging technology to do this, which is what I do up at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, an electroencephalograph then is a machine that picks up very small electrical signals under the scalp. We use electrodes to pick up these signals, we convert these signals into an algorithm, which is then processed by our analysis software. What we find when we look at these kinds of problems, for example, then, is that it seems to be intention that's the first input into moral decision making. So remember, again, at the very start, this very historical quote that the authors of the paper said, that in the time, you know, the biblical times, people actually, it, it revealed something about the way they thought. Well, this does too. Imagine, for example, that there's an actor with a golf club, he stood in front of another actor, he pulls back, and then he takes a swing and hits them. Imagine the same situation, but the other actor's behind him, he takes a swing, and he hits him behind him. So it's quite obvious to us that in the first scenario that this is on purpose. This is an intentional act, he's trying to cause harm. And it's just as obvious to most of us that actually the second problem is an accident. This is what the brain thinks as well. Without any real reflective deliberation, the brain actually thinks this, it picks up on it. What we have here in the image is basically two distinctly different waves within the brain that denote um, a different activity that's going on when you view ac accidental harm as opposed to intentional harm. The waveform for accidental harm persists for a lot longer. What does it mean by a lot longer? It's only 400 milliseconds, but the EEG gives us very, very good temporal measurements so that the when and the speed of something rather than where in the brain it happens. And this effect, again, you might think it's just one individual study. This is replicated throughout many, many other neuroimaging studies, this very effect, including fMRI. Now, I'm in no way an fMRI expert. However, Green et al. are. They use problems such as the trolley problems amongst many, many others. And they've shown through a wealth of research that actually there are very, very, very many areas in the brain that seem to be involved in the modulation of emotion, the incorporation of emotion into decision-making and cognitive conflict. These different colored images on the brain then, these represent particular areas that we think are involved in moral decision making. And whilst we're actually, that's a good point that I should make is in neuroscience we've got a problem. It's called the inverse problem. 
And this basically means that actually just because you can see activation occurring in somewhere in the brain, it doesn't mean that it comes from there, just that it's involved. And being able to say that activation seems to occur in an area tells you nothing about the distribution of it either, which is also quite helpful in seeing how different areas of the brain communicate from one to another. But we know from this, especially with areas like the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, about here, not particularly a technical gesture, but that's where it is, if we damage it, our abilities at moral decision making amongst a host of other canonical behaviours that make us human are also impaired. We, for example, see the case of Phineas Gage, who has done psychology? Quite a lot of people, okay? But for the benefit of those who haven't, uh, Phineas Gage was a railroad worker. He took a tamping iron, which is this rod, to the prefrontal cortex, and it changed his decision making abilities. It also lowered his inhibitions amongst a host of other behavioral problems. There's also been a more recent case of this, a man called Eduardo Liet in Brazil. He took a, a construction rod through his um, head from top to bottom. So this case, it was through the grimacing on your face there. Gruesome, isn't it? But everyone seems to love these kind of stories. I'd be very, very interested to see the prognosis of Eduardo's condition, although to date I'm not quite sure what that is. I'll be able to tell you, I'll have a look in the break. But we know that Traumatic brain injury can change the behavior of a person as well as their decision-making abilities. We know again, it's the ventromedial prefrontal cortex that it seems to be. Damage to it increases utilitarian decision-making, especially in that 1v5 discrimination. So that problem that most of us find extremely easy to solve, whether it's an incidental one or the instrumental version, the flipping or the pushing, people with traumatic brain injury to this area tend to have a lot more problem doing so. The authors in this study interpreted this as being due to a lack of empathic concern and compassion, feelings of guilt. So when we're talking about using system one to mediate system two, this is exactly what we're talking about. He didn't have system one in place in order to tell, that, well these people didn't have system one in, in place to tell them that actually there was some emotional importance to that situation that made the 1v5 push scenario taboo. But we also know that when we damage areas like the prefrontal cortex, it elicits various behaviors that are related to conditions like psychopathy. So clinical psychopaths share similarities with brain damage, tra traumatic brain damage individuals. Um, and psychop psychopathy, for example, is defined as people, even healthy people, who rate quite highly on scales of psychoticism, extroversion, neuroticism, Machiavellianism, things like this, a lie scale. And we find that even in healthy populations, High psychoticism leads to a decreased amount of empathic concern and an increase in utilitarian decision-making problems. Now you might think, well, hang on Glenn, you said that utilitarianism was the sort of morally virtuous act that we should all follow. Are psychopaths more moral than the rest of us? I don't think that's actually the case. Again, it seems to be the, more of the case that the regions that are associated with intuitive emotional responses are dampened somewhat and that they just see it as a particularly statistical calculation and nothing more. It doesn't mean that they're any more or less uh, morally sort of able than everyone else. It just means they don't have the same kind of intuitions as everybody else. We also see that again in high trait um, psychopathy, patients again, well not again, not patients, healthy people, that we have a decreased recognition of the emotional salience of a situation. So these images just depict uh, what are called the early, anti early anterior positivity in the brain. You can see there that actually in low trait psychopathy individuals, there's a lot more activation. In high trait psychopathy individuals, there's a lot less. This means that the participants that are low trait notice the emotional salience of whatever stimuli that's being presented to them. Those with high don't. You can also see that we call this the late positive potential. This is an EEG reading and it means what happens just after the stimulus presentation. And you can see that low trait psychopathy has a lot more activation than high trait psychopathy. This is extremely important because it again signifies that there's something going on in the brain of although it's a healthy person, someone who exhibits high trait psychopathy that's a lot different from the rest of us who we would like to think are quite morally in tune with those around us. So we've got this individual experience in the time that I've got left. It's shaped by our social behaviors. We also have a convergence of evidence in biology that says that it seems to be people with big brains and animals with big brains that exhibit the same sort of behaviors that we could actually link with 
moral behavior. Not so much in animals, but you know, they are quite sophisticated, some of them, just not on the level that we are. And we know that actually, if you damage the brain, that these behaviors can be completely adjusted. If not forever, then in the short term as well. And we see that even in healthy individuals, they share traits of psychopathy with brain damaged patients. Again, this shows that not just damage, but a difference in personality may account for some of the variations in the way people make moral decisions. Some of the research that I'll be conducting over the next um, two years. First is a behavioral experiment. Remember I said before, you know, each EEG study needs a good behavioral experiment to follow. Otherwise, it's impossible really to do the experiment without something to look for to begin with. And we'll be looking at an online and lab-based study. So I'll be asking questions of people online and getting them into the lab to do the study. We're looking at high and low psychopathy in healthy individuals. Clinical populations are quite hard to get access to. Um, and I'm using written problems to stay true to a lot of the research that's already out there. We'll be using moral lethal, so the trolley problem, moral non-lethal, so some things like the, um, the recruitment problem. And we'll be using other problems that uh, don't have any moral element at all, just to see if people get the distinction between the moral, the non-moral, and the moral lethal. Following on from this then, we'll do an EEG study. I actually helped to develop the EEG lab up at um, UCLan. It's not in full swing yet. We've taken quite a lot of data with it, but it's quite a laborious process to go through it all to make sure if it's actually airtight and we can use it in a study. But again, we're looking at high and low levels of trait psychopathy in healthy individuals. But this time, we're not just asking them questions. We're looking at what we call event-related potentials, which are just the, it's the time at which, in the brain, activation occurs relative to when the stimuli is presented. We're also looking at the response times of individuals because there are various markers out there that would suggest that response times differ as well. There are some problems with neuroimaging research, so I've already mentioned the inverse problems. It would be unfair for you to walk away from this and think, well, that guy on stage is going to go and find out something that blasts the academic world open. There are problems such as the difference between visual. So we've talked about a visual study with regards to the golf club swing, and we've talked about written, image, written stimuli as well, like the trolley problem. There are differences here in image complexity, so it might take someone quite a long time to tell the difference between a five verse one picture versus a 10 verse one picture, and you wouldn't really get at the decision you were looking for if people are spending too much time just mulling over what the picture shows exactly. You also have stimuli and ERP anomalies, so for example, believe it or not, the weather could change outside here, and the equipment wouldn't work as well. It's that temperamental. And participants do irritating things as well, like breathe and blink, um, all sorts of things that, if it occurs over the ERP event that you're looking for, can completely invalidate a dis uh, data set, and then you'll have to get rid of them. And this takes about two hours to go through for each experiment, so really, we I'd rather take their eyelids off, if I'm completely honest. But thank you for listening to me. Um, I hope I've done enough to at least suggest that it's us, the, the individual, that has sufficiently evolved and healthy brain that we share with other organisms on the planet, and as part of wider society, whether that's a religious group or a non-religious social group, whether it's a rock concert or a Star Trek convention, actually produces whatever social norms and rules within those groups and the moral codes that we choose to live by. Thank you for listening, and I'm open to any easy questions. I recently heard about a study, I don't really know the details, you might know more details about this, uh, about fMRI scanning of uh, people who believe in God, and uh, when they're asked to um, explain what they believe about some moral situation of some sort, their own, part of, part of their own brain sort of lights up, and if they're asked to explain uh, what someone else might think about that same issue, another part of the brain uh, lights up. And when they're asked to explain what they think God would say is right or wrong, their own part of the brain lights up. Do you know, have you heard of that? Do you know any details about that? I tried to caveat this by saying I wasn't an fMRI expert. Um, however, I think I do know what you're referring to. That work by Sam Harris, he looked at whether people make particularly accurate judgments between but what they believe is true and what is outrightly not true in, a, I think it was syllogistic reasoning problems. I'm not sure if, if someone knows any better than me that might be able to correct me. But he found something similar to um, what you did. And it's true that people actually will make these intuitive 
judgments that make sense to themselves, as you're saying, that they can see the logic that someone else might apply to it, but that also when they're asked the question, that question as well, it's the exact same part of the brain that's used. Now, I don't think that this detracts from much of what I was actually saying because we all use these different processes. It's just that actually, if you maybe are inculcated to believe in something particularly I don't know, out there when you're a child, this becomes habitual. So it's very easy for this to activate a particular area of the brain where this is um, enshrined within, although we don't know if particular knowledge is actually in one part of the brain or another. Um, I think what Sam's work seeks to do is use um, neuropsychology or neuroscience, which is what he actually does, to talk about this problem and try and address it. I don't think there's particularly anything in neuroscience that can say that actually you're less logical or less coherent than someone just because you believe these kind of things. I don't think really that neuroscience can touch upon that kind of um, suggestion. But I do think that it's quite interesting to talk about. Does that answer your question? I'll try to be a bit more coherent in future. With regards to that last question, I suspect what he was talking about was Epley 2009, where people were asked to um, suggest what they thought George Bush, the average American, Bill Gates, themselves or God thought about um, things like uh, gay rights and marijuana legislation and so forth. And um, the extrapersonal brain came into play for everything except self and God. Um, the one slight exception, bizarrely, was Bill Gates, which started to become intrapersonal. But um, I think that was probably the one because uh, um, Harris was more um, truth versus lie and how you process um, religious truth versus um, secular truth and so forth. So. Um, I was just in interested with regards to the moral problem for trolleys and so on and so forth. When you get into large numbers, um, how do you uh, make allowances for things like chunking and satisficing and, and those decision-making non-moral elements uh, when it comes to large numbers and numerosity and so on and so forth? Um, how do you uh, allow for that, account for that and so on? Because then it's either the non-moral and the moral sort of clash and it becomes an issue of, of how well you process the information. Um, and you mentioned Chomsky, so we're dealing with things like um, Chomsky's levels of processing and so on as well. So it very quickly becomes quite knotty. What a question. Um, I, can't, I don't think I can answer that in a concise statement. Um, we do try to control for these different variables, though. We, use, we try to counterbalance things. We try to randomly order them so we don't get things like practice effects when we talk about um, the stimuli presentation. When we come to large numbers, as you're saying, well, the problem that I showed up on screen, that was just a one verse five. If you show somebody, we well, we'll think about um, intervention in Syria, I think of a practical example. If we were talking about sacrificing 10,000 military personnel to save 50,000 you know, blameless civilians, you might indeed get a different answer there. But it, and it could be down to this large number effect where people just see more risk. And of course, the right to see more risk and assume more risk because there are more people at risk, but they might give a different answer. Right now, we are just sticking to the, the smaller numbers, our, our study is about this instrumental incidental effect, um, and that's pretty much what I have on that. Thinking about um, society today, <coughs> the, um, how would you rate individualism as compared with group loyalty? Uh, they're both obviously important factors, but are we being more individualist and therefore perhaps more moral? Uh, or are we lo losing our group loyalties and therefore falling into various other problems? I think that in the UK, particularly, we've got a freedom to talk about these things that we've been talking about already. So through being an individual in a society, you can talk to other people and you will be able to, to deliberate with them and map your judgments onto you know, what they are. And they will weigh up sort of how what the best course of action is, rather than just saying, well, this is good for me, um, so this is what I'll advocate. For example, with regards to um, the issue with um, equal marriage, which I don't think is an issue at all, um, if you had an individual's view that actually gay marriage is wrong based on whatever precedent, then you're trying to say that the rest, into the rest of society that this should be the precedent. But then when you deliberate with other people, you actually come to realize that this isn't a sustainable position because much of the rest of society disagree with you. And so does quite a lot of the research. I keep hearing people say things like, it's the, the miracle of, or the, the mystery of homosexuality to sort of justify their own bigotry. But I do think that as a society in the UK, 
we are a society of you know ind individualist people. We do a lot of us believe in capitalism, but at the same time, we are open to discussion about a lot of other issues, and we actually come to a more sort of not group think, but a more group centric look at society and what we should see as our own social norms. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm quite intrigued. Um, when, when you get perhaps somebody who has uh, perhaps psychopathic tendencies, perhaps in jail, you tend to get a lot of uh, religious people going in to try and spread the word. Some uh, people come out of that um, uh, new, uh, uh, newly converted, uh, totally moral people. It's almost like a gear change and attribute it to some kind of religious experience. Has any exper have any experiments been done to see what changes, sudden dramatic changes go on the, in the brain for somebody who suddenly, almost overnight, switches from a sort of psychopathic outlook to a totally moral outlook? I'm not too sure about clinical populations in you know, a forensic setting. That's probably one of the hardest um, settings to get access to as a research. I've not actually seen any papers on that. But I'm aware of the fact that you know people do go in there. They are approached by members of religious communities, and they do come out much more what we would say as you know subjectively moral um, than they went in. Not too sure about that. If you ever wanted to go in and be a humanist chaplain, I think actually Pavan's looking for people to go in and do just that in um, the prison service. But I actually think that there are other maybe there are other treatments that are going on in prison. So there are very novel treatments, for example, such as equine therapy. If anyone's ever heard of that. The idea is that if you get somebody that is a, a psychopath um, and you put them in front of horses or other types of animals, you can teach them a behavior, um, a lot more subdued sort of mannerisms. You know, you, everyone knows that if you approach a horse, you do it quite calmly in a different way, so it doesn't kick in the face, basically. But then the hope is that they'll go out of the prison system and apply this frame of mind to interactions with other people. I'm not too sure how much that works, but that, that's a kind of therapy that goes on in prison, um, not related to religious conversion of any type. And there are various other behavioral therapies that go on that I think might have more to do with it than just religious conversion. But again, I don't have any evidence either way, so I would hesitate to make a judgment on that. Hi there. Uh, thanks for your talk. Hey. I just, um, you mentioned Sam Harris before. I just wanted to come back to him because he's quite um, has strong views on how neuroscience and kind of big data should be part of debates on all sorts of these kind of social and moral issues. Where do you think we are in terms of neuroscience and other sciences having a, a big voice in kind of public policy. Uh, do you think we're there yet or already? How, how do you think the debate's going? To be completely honest, I don't think that neuroscience has got that much to say about how we should um, run societies. I know, for example, um, I think Sam, does, he doesn't advocate, but he, he explains along the lines of, um, I think it was actually, he was challenged by someone at a conference would it be moral to use um, sort of oxytocin or something to engender trust in a terrorist in order to get them to confess to various um, plans that they were uh, that they were uh, plotting to, to perpetrate? And this was an issue of you know can we invade someone's cognitive liberty? And that's probably something that neuroscience has got something to say on. But with regards to the organisation of you know wider society, um, I do think that, that there's no amount of sort of neuroscientific evidence that would say that just because X electrical impulse happens in the brain before you make a decision that this is the way we should go. I do think that it's a lot more, sort of, a, not a collectivist view, but, but, but what I've been trying to push is to actually deliberate between ourselves rather than just listen to the hard and fast science. I mean, it's, it's like, and we could say the same about free will, for example. I mean, you could say that there are various electrical impulses that presuppose all of our decisions, therefore there's no free will. But so long as we as a society act like that we have it, we act like that we're actually you know, conscientious agents, that we are quite predictable, which is why we make laws, for example. We try to constrain our free will in a way by making laws for which there are punishments if we transgress against them. So as long as we're, we've, we think of ourselves as a, you know, a, an agent with you know, agency in society, as long as we can at least predict what people are about to do, and um, that there are repercussions for going against the norm, I don't think really neuroscience has got a lot to say about that because we act as if we have, you know, the control over our social and political policies. And for me, I think the long and short of it is that, you know, I will think like I think I have, you know, moral judgment rather than listen to neuroscience to tell me that X or Y is a right or wrong decision. I think we have to stop there. We're out of time, but thank you, thank very, you very much, much Glenn. Very much indeed. Yeah.